This Let's Edit with Media Composer tutorial is brought to you by VideoGuys.com, the leading reseller of video editing and production equipment for more than 25 years. And by Boris FX, a leading developer of visual effect plugins, titling, video editing, and workflow tools for broadcast, post-production, and film professionals. Hey everyone, Kevin P. McAuliffe here and I am back again with another Let's Edit with Avid Media Composer tutorial and in this lesson we're talking about the new features inside of the 2020.4 update to Avid Media Composer. There's a bunch of great in-your-face features as well as some big under the hood features and we're going to get in and talk about a lot of them in this lesson. All right, now before we get rolling, a couple things I want to talk about that's going on under the hood of the new 2020.4 update to Avid Media Composer. Now, I'll normally say at this point something like, you know, it's probably a good idea for you to take a look at the what's new in Media Composer 2020.4 notes because we're not going to be covering everything that's new in this tutorial. But what I'm going to say this time is I absolutely recommend, absolutely, that you download the what's new document. Now, why? It's more so for the Avid Universal Media Engine section that we'll talk about in just a second. But what I do want to talk about right off the bat is the two features you'll see right at the very top, Apple ProRes support and Catalina support. Now, you're probably thinking, well, Kev, you've talked for, you know, years about how ProRes is supported inside of Avid Media Composer, and it is still supported much like it was before. You are still able to link to and consolidate ProRes files because ProRes is an Avid friendly codec. But what the 2020.4 update does do for all of my Windows friends out there is that it will now allow you to export ProRes as well as work with it natively inside of Avid Media Composer. That is a huge, 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 huge feature update right there. So now you can deliver ProRes files directly from Avid Media Composer as a .mov file. All right, now the next feature update is Catalina support for all my Mac friends out there. Now keep in mind that with this feature update, you also lose the ability to work with the standard title tool and the marquee title tool, and you will be limited to working with Avid Titler Plus, or if you're like me, you'll work with Boris Title Studio, which has been supported inside of Media Composer for a super long time now. To be honest, I, I, it's got to be over a year now at this point. An absolutely fantastic 2D and 3D titling application that we will get into and talk more about in the coming months. All right, now, speaking of the Universal Media Engine, I've just taken some highlights out of the What's New document. You'll notice that right away at the top, the Universal Media Engine is replacing the Avid Generic plugin. So keep that in mind. You will no longer see the Avid Generic plugin inside of the source browser anymore and when linking and importing the universal media engine will be used for linking and importing the following types of files inside of 2020.4 now obviously the most important is the .mov files but you'll see also supported mp4 tiffs pngs jpeg exr both as single images and image sequences as well as mp3 and aac now for exporting you'll see that the universal media engine will handle .mov files and .exr files. Now, this is why I said that it's exceptionally important for you to read the What's New document. You'll see now that we'll get into what are improvements. And to be honest, I'm not going to go through all of these because everybody's situation is slightly different. Everybody works with different types of files. So if you're running into file problems when trying to bring things in, you're definitely going to want to reference this document to figure out what's going on. You'll see we have improvements when working with it and even things that are currently not supported with the Universal Media Engine doesn't mean they won't be supported down the road. But as of this release and as of this recording, these formats are not supported. All right, couple of quick last things. First, the default location on Mac OS X for where you can write media to has been changed because with 10.15 point whatever version of Catalina you're running, you cannot write media to the root of the boot drive. So therefore, the default location for the Avid Media Files folder has changed with this release. You'll see where it's going to for Windows, where it's going to for Mac. And to be honest, I should put a giant you know red X through this because friends don't let friends write media on their local machine. You should always be writing media files onto an external drive 
just to keep everything nice and organized. Now, one last thing that you're gonna have to wrap your head around, and that is the naming convention has changed for DNX HD files. Now this, if you're an After Effects user, is not new. This has actually uh, you know, been around for oof, a long time, pretty much since the uh, QuickTime support stopped, uh, at least for After Effects. And this naming has become pretty common across all the other applications that work with Media Composer files. Now I'm just gonna focus in on the 1080i 5994 uh, you know, project and frame rate as an example. And let's take a look at DNX HD 145, 220, and 220X that you will find here, here, and here. You'll notice that for the Avid DNX HD 145 files, which I sort of call the standard for 1080i work, that has now been renamed as DNX HD standard quality. For the 220 files, it's now called high quality. For the 220X, it's called high quality X. Now, as you can see, if you take a look down the list, this concept is the same across all of the different frame rates and resolutions. So you're gonna need to now start to learn these new terms as opposed to talking about DNX HD 145, 220, 220X, because new users to Media Composer will have no idea of what you're talking about, okay? But again, all of the new naming is in that What's New document, so I highly encourage you to check it out. So we're now ready to jump into Media Composer and to talk about the in-your-face new features that are available to you inside of 2020.4. And we're gonna start out right away in the project selection window. As you can see, everything's looking a little bit different and I love this window and I hate it for one specific reason. I love it because of just all the information now for all my projects is right here in my face. Everything from the project type to the frame rate to the raster dimension and I love the fact that the creation date and the modified date are there as well. So that does beg the big question, what do I hate about it? Well, what I hate about it is now the fact that when I create a new project, I am now forced to step into that project before I can create another project. So for example, if you're an assistant working on, you know, 30 episodes of Survivor and you just want to create 30 projects that are just called, you know, show one, show two, show three, show four, you now no longer have the ability to do that. You have to create project number one, you have to step into it, you then have to step out of it, create a new project, step into the next one, step out, create a new project, et cetera, et cetera. So keep that in mind when you are working, okay? So let's now step into Media Composer and talk about a few of the other new features that we have inside of this update. Now, as always, before we get rolling, I do want to give a big shout out to our footage sponsor. That is ArtGrid.io for providing this beautiful footage for us to work with. You can download these clips plus thousands of others over at ArtGrid.io and there's even a link in the show notes below for you to quickly click on to get over to their site. All right, so I think we're going to start down here inside of the timeline, and we're going to talk about three features available to us, new features inside of the timeline window. And the first one is the sequence map. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to zoom in on part of my timeline right about here. And what I'd really like to do is to be able to see my entire timeline and to pan through it without having to constantly zoom back, zoom in, and you know do all that type of stuff that normally takes us more extra time to be able to do. So what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to right click in the timeline area and I'm gonna come down here to show sequence map that's going to appear down here in the lower right hand corner and I can now quickly go through my entire timeline from start to end and really focus in on whatever area I wanna focus in on without having to zoom back. Now you'll know that we have the bin map feature as well where we can get in and zoom through all the thumbnails in our bin in a very similar way where a little window like this will appear in the upper right hand corner of the bin itself. All right, now let's talk about one thing that always drives me a little bit bonkers, okay? And what I'm gonna do is just zoom back and you'll see that I have two audio clips in my timeline right here. And what I normally like to do is I don't wanna have all this extra little bit of silence. Now, this was just something I recorded very roughly. You'll notice it doesn't actually go to complete silence here. We got a little blip right here. But what I'd like to do is I'd like to trim this down to only the sections of the actual audio that are being used without me having to go through and mark an in point, mark an out point. I mean, it's not a big deal when you're only dealing with two tracks. But if you're dealing with 30 tracks and you want to get in and remove all of the essentially blank space or the silent space, 
I really wish I could do that in one shot. Well, now I can. What I'm going to do is I'm going to right click and I'm going to come down and say strip silence from sequence. Now I'm going to be brought to this window. And what I'm going to do is to basically choose a silence threshold. Now I played around with this a little bit so I didn't have to do this while I was recording it. I believe the default is minus 45 dB or minus 50 dB. And for me, because I have all this little sort of extra noise in here and this little blip, I found that minus 20 was sort of a great default uh, for me silence threshold to work with. You could set the minimum duration, but what I did is I got in and added a little bit of pad at the start and at the end of each one of these clips so that when I come and I say OK, you'll see that Media Composer, and it always helps if you actually select both tracks that you want to do that to, so that when Media Com Composer comes through and strips the silence out, you'll see it added a little bit of pad at the top and tail if I wanted to fade in and fade out, but you'll see that you can literally remove all of the silence from your timeline in one quick click of the mouse. Now, also inside of the sequence, window or the timeline window, we now have the ability to map commands down here. Now, to be honest, I pretty much use all of these except for the focus button. And I believe this one here was to toggle an external display, which to be honest, I never use. Uh, I pretty much will sometimes use full screen playback if I happen to have a client sitting here and I'm only working on one screen. But you know, again, it's just extra flexibility, the ability to move tools around here at the bottom if you want to, to help streamline your overall workflow. All right, let's talk about mask margins and let's talk about frame flex. So what has been added inside of those two tools to help make your life easier? Well, in the day of social media, we always want to get in and we want to either set our clips up to work for Instagram or for Facebook slash Snapchat. So what we now have the ability to do is inside of our source settings, if I come to frame flex, you'll see that I can come down and I can set my frame flex aspect ratio to any of the new default ones, such as 16 or pardon me, nine by 16 or one by one. Now you'll notice that as soon as I set this to be nine by 16, my image becomes stretched here. You're probably thinking, well, Kev, is that a bug? Nope, not a bug because remember, we're reformatting this for a stretch. I just want to pillar or letterbox it. And now everything is looking exactly the way that it should. Doesn't matter which social media layout that I choose to get in and work with FrameFlex with. Now, that is FrameFlex. What we also have the ability to do is to hit Command, Shift, and the equal sign. That's Control, Shift, and equals for all my Windows friends out there. We can come down to Mask Margins, and we can set this up as a mask margin in our timeline as well. Now keep in mind, once you set that, you actually have to right click on your timeline or sequence window and then actually turn mask margins on. You'll see right here, target mask, we'll just have a black mask and there you go. There's our nine by 16 mask margin all set to go, ready for us to work with. So if we wanted to get in, drop some 3D warp effects on and slide our footage around, we can do that right now. I'm just going to come up and turn off our target mask. And let's now, this is actually a great one. I really like this one only because I actually got an email from a tutorial viewer like a week ago and I wasn't actually able to talk about it. But if I hit command or control and eight, you will notice that when I call up the effects palette, take a look at the size of the text in here. You'll notice that if I right click, I can come down and set the font type to be whatever I want, but more specifically, I can get in and set the size of the text in here to be whatever size I want it to be. All right, so let's just do a couple more here. And for our next new feature, we're heading to our settings. I'm gonna to come to the user settings. I'm gonna come down to my interface settings. I'm just gonna double click on that. And if you take a look down here towards the bottom, You'll see we have our time code window brightness that we can adjust via a slider right here as well as if I come to timeline and viewers, you'll see that we can adjust the timeline and composer icon brightness. I never knew that was sort of a thing that everybody was, you know, really concerned about. Uh, but we can do that right here. I can come down and say apply and you'll notice that they all dim down or I can drag that right up and hit apply and they'll all brighten up. So again, if you want to get in and adjust the brightness of those icons, you can simply do that. I'll just set mine back to the default right there. 
And the last feature that I'm going to talk about in this tutorial is the bulk edit feature. I'm just going to apply that. I'm going to close the interface settings. I'm going to close my settings window. And I'm going to come back to my bin and I'm going to select these five clips right here. And I'm going to right click on them and I'm going to navigate down to bulk edit. Now, you'll see which column do we want to modify, the name or the drive. So you'll see I can't modify all of them like start time code, end time code, or duration. I can only get in and modify specific columns that, of course, would actually let me do that. Now, where this comes in really handy is in situations where you'll get camera files that come in and they're all labeled as 00 this or, you know, 005, 00E120324. And you want to just get in and call them camera 1, camera 2, camera 3, camera 4. So in this case, what I can do is I can get in and I can select, we'll use the name as an example. Now, what do I want to do? Now, you'll notice what's also great is that the tooltip will pop up if I leave the mouse sitting over top of it. Change which items, you'll see. Do we want to change all bin items, all master clips, all sub clips, all sequences, or just the selection? Well, since I have these files selected, we'll select just that. Replace the column data with formatting string specified text, counter, or column data. Well, because I want this to be specified text, we're just going to call this sea lions are cool. And you'll notice that as I'm typing this in, you'll see this is the name, this is the modified value. So if I was to now come in and say commit, you'll notice that sea lions are cool is now the name of all of those clips. Now, keep in mind, I obviously wouldn't name each individual clip sea lions are cool. But like I said, this is where you would get in. You would select 10 files that you know are all camera one. Go in, bulk edit, camera one, enter. This way you don't have to copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste, copy, paste to each one. You can simply go through, select the first 10, camera one, next 10, camera two, next 10, camera three, and so on and so on to make your life a million times easier. Now, there are a few other feature updates inside of 2020.4, so I encourage you, I don't encourage you, I require you, I, I, I strenuously hope that you'll download the readme file, and I'm gonna put a link to it in the tutorial notes below, so you can click on it, download it, have it on your computer, so if you run into any issues, especially with the Universal Media Engine, you'll easily be able to look them up and get any problems you have resolved quickly and easily. All right, now as we're wrapping up, I want to remind you to check out our sponsors, Video Guys, for all of your Avid software and hardware, as well as thousands of other products that you can check out over at videoguys.com. And I also want to give a big shout out to the team at Boris FX, makers of Continuum, Sapphire, and Mocha. And don't forget to use that coupon code of MC101 to get 10% off your next Continuum purchase. If you like this tutorial, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. And don't forget, if you have any questions, you have any comments, or you have any tutorial requests, don't hesitate to send them to me at kevinpmcauliffe at gmail.com. This has been Kevin P. McAuliffe. Thanks a lot for watching.